Uh, hi, uh, my name is Bill Cardalopoulos. Welcome to the 365th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. That's um, a pretty mind-blowing number, 365 uh, such meetings. Um, so now at this point, uh, you know, if sadly they're not all recorded, but had they all been, you could now spend a year watching a symposium meeting every single day. Um, uh, this is my um, first time hosting the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. I was actually 365 meetings ago. I was at that first meeting and I spoke at the second meeting. Um, and I'm really pleased that um, this series has continued for so long. It's been over 10 years. Um, and one thing that, that I always think is worth remembering is that the New York Comic and Picture Story Symposium started actually as an outgrowth of um, activity connected to Occupy Wall Street. Um, at the time, there had been an idea to do something called Occupy University. And the idea was to sort of take education uh, from you know, the walled garden of the university and sort of you know, open it up to the outside world. And the idea was something like you know, free education with a kind of, um, I think, egalitarian relationship between the teacher and the student with people kind of sharing those roles. Um, and so what that has evolved into has been this really fascinating speaker series focused on comics, but also just general um, topics and visual narrative. We've covered things like illuminated manuscripts and puppet theaters and uh, toy theaters and all, all manner of kind of visual, textual um, combination and visual narrative. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, as I said, I've been involved, I suppose, with the symposium for a while. Um, as many of you may also know, for most of the symposium's existence, it's been organized and curated uh, by Ben Kachor, uh, who started this weekly event. Um, last, for the past year, it was guest curated uh, by Austin English, who's here with us tonight, only just as, as, a, as an audience member. Um, and this year, uh, Austin and Ben are both involved, uh, and they've also brought me and Lily Correa in as guest curators. So we'll all be um, moderating individual sessions over the course of the fall season. Um, so coming in as now a co-organizer of the symposium, um, I did want to make sure among you know the various people who I was inviting in to include um, you know some scholars, you know people from the world of academia, um, you know because I think we have a lot of artists uh, and and people who are involved with the production of comics, like publishers, editors. Gary Groth was here last week, um, but uh, you know I wanted to kind of uh, I'm not, like, you know, kind of create some continuity with that idea of kind of taking the, you know, taking, taking academia and, and taking it outside of the, removing it from the context of academia, maybe taking scholarship and uh, removing it from the context of academia is maybe a better way of saying that. Um, so to wit, um, I was really happy when, to hear uh, that uh, Margaret Galvin uh, had a new book coming out. Uh, uh, I've worked with Margaret before. Uh, she's moderated panels at the MOCA Festival where I'm the programming director, including a really terrific one that we did about women's comics. Um, and what I saw at that panel was the really interesting ways in which Margaret works with archives um, and sort of um, uses archives as a way of kind of reframing um, the kind of knowledge we can have uh, about different projects, different milieus, different movements, different um, affinity groups, and so forth. Um, so uh, what we're going to be hearing about tonight is uh, kind of a talk, as I understand it, based on a chapter um, from Margaret's forthcoming book, Invisible Archives, Queer and Feminist Culture in the 1980s which is coming out in a couple of weeks from the University uh, of Minnesota Press. Um, so I'm going to read a, a bio uh, that Margaret has provided. But before uh, and, and after that, Margaret will begin her presentation. Um, but the other thing I wanted to note is that um, Margaret will talk for about, I guess, 40 to 60 minutes. Uh, and after that, we will have time for Q&A. Um, during the course of Margaret's talk, um, if any questions come to mind that you know you're going to want to ask during the Q&A, um, I would recommend that you post them in the chat 
Um, but also indicate if you want me to read the question. If you just post a question, I'll assume that you want me to call on you afterwards for the Q&A. If you say, I would like this question to be read, then I can just go ahead and read uh, the question to Margaret um, after uh, she finishes her talk. Um, otherwise, of course, if something comes to mind afterwards, you can always just raise your hand, either your physical hand or your virtual hand here on Zoom. Uh, at when we get to the Q&A section. Okay, so I think that's it for introductions in particulars. So now um, let me introduce our guest tonight. Um, Margaret Galvin is Assistant Professor of Visual Rhetoric in the Department of English at the University of Florida. Her archivally informed research examines how comics and other forms of visual culture operate within social movements and includes a first book, Invisible Archives, Queer and Feminist Visual Culture in the 1980s, out this fall from University of Minnesota Press. In 2021 to 22, she was in residence at the Stanford Humanities Center as the Distinguished Junior External Fellow, researching a second book about how communities of LGBTQ cartoonists innovated comics through grassroots formats. Her publications on comics and social movements can be found in journals like American Literature, Archive Journal, Australian Feminist Studies, Inks, Journal of Lesbian Studies, and WSQ. Uh, and her website is margaretgalvin.org. You can always catch up uh, with her latest research and activity there. Uh, but for the moment, uh, I invite you all to please uh, give your attention to Margaret and her presentation tonight. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Um, grabbing the PowerPoint. Um, okay, so let's play from start. Um, okay, so uh, what you're gonna hear tonight is I'm gonna do uh, from my book, the first three pages of introduction to situate us and then portions of chapter two about Lee Mars, Roberta Gregory, and at the end, a bit about the lesbian comics boom um, that these two artists and others facilitate. Um, so I'm really excited to share this with you all. And here's all my information. Um, okay, cool. Um, okay, so across the 1980s, women in fe feminist and gay and lesbian movements in the United States celebrated their sexuality as one of the interlocking parts of their identity in response to constrained, constraining cultural phenomenon like the feminist sex wars, conservative political norms, and the HIV AIDS crisis. 40 years later, we widely remember their words in essays, manifestos, and march chants as they shifted the feminist movement towards a sex positive third wave and participated in gay and lesbian organizing that fed into groups like ACT UP, Queer Nation, and Lesbian Adventures. By contrast, we have overlooked how women wielded images to theorize their embodied sexuality directly and their art created within grassroots networks has been mostly forgotten. The eight artists I study in this book collectively depicted sexuality by embedding their own individual experiences within a larger framework. Through collages, cartoons, drawings, and photographs, Hannah Alderfair, Beth Jaker, Mary Beth Nelson, Roberta Gregory, Lee Mars, Alison Bechtel, Gloria Anzaldúa, and Nan Golden represented their own perspectives and those are a wider range of people around them in order to document the intersectional diversity of bodies and sexual identities that made up their communities. Within the past 20 years, newly processed collections within archives have begun to make these women's powerful visual contributions available once more. And yet, visibility is tenuous and not guaranteed. These women exist in visible archives, both present and precarious. The paradox of this book's title reflects the hard-won and narrowly kept conditions of visibility for diverse sexual identities. As the artists featured in this book were trying to make their lives and sexualities visible, they were facing censorship and critique, even from within their own movements. The call was all too often coming from inside the house. Further, we are at a historic moment now where a number of the social advances discussed in this book are on the verge of collapse underlining just how much women's sexuality and LGBTQ identity remain both dangerous and revolutionary. These women and countless others are preserved in visible archives, but their memory and legacy are not guaranteed. 
It is my hope that recovering the grassroots tactics for how these artists made their communities visible and advocated for their rights amidst uh, unprecedented adversity may inspire future activists. By building worlds around their individual experiences, the artists analyzed in this book insisted that their experiences be seen and valued as universal. Their art functions as collective autobiography in how they drew themselves within a larger community and then welcomed others to imagine themselves within that world. By foregrounding the importance of community in their visual representations, their approaches encouraged women and LGBTQ viewers who encountered their work to reflect on their own experiences of sexuality and feel like they were part of something larger than themselves. The artists deploy these visual tactics not only to bring people together in community, but also to recognize how their own individual work grew out of, reflected, and was supported by a collective of individuals. The career trajectory of each of the artists in this book shows how they anticipate later developments in feminist as well as gay and lesbian thinking and artwork. This forward-looking um, artwork sometimes set them at odds with their contemporaries, but the community they invoked supported their values in future years. They're repudiated in their time during the feminist sex wars. The precepts of the sex positive feminists were woven into the fabric of the third wave in the 90s, and the visual style of the artist behind the censored diary from the Barnard Sex Conference, Hannah Alderfair, Beth Jaker, and Mary Beth Nelson, prefigured the DIY style behind zines that become so popular during the riot girl movement in the 90s. Moreover, the lesbian and bisexual content within the underground comics movement as captured in solo works by Roberta Gregory Lee Mars and Lee Mars would find a home and flourish in the gay comic series of the 80s and 90s and facilitate a lesbian comics boom among a new generation of artists in the 1990s. From its local beginnings in the pages of grassroots newspapers in the 80s, Alison Bechdel's Dykes to Watch Out for a Comic Strip would become such a subcultural phenomenon that many young women in the 90s and beyond would tell Bechdel they learned what it meant to be a lesbian from the strip. Gloria Ansel Dua's editorial work with this bridge called My Back um, and individualized writing in Borderlands La Frontera were immediately successful and would continue to be so in subsequent years as she was invited to talk at multiple public lectures annually, where she illustrated her popular concepts and drawings that have not yet been examined as vital sites of visual for theorization and community formation. At the time that Nan Golden began to show her photography in the 1980s, color photography was not yet standard um, in the high art world, but her work and its snapshot aesthetic became widely influential in subsequent years, such that the groundbreaking defiant nature of her formal choices is no longer as immediately apparent to modernize. All of these artists created their work against the backdrop of the 1980s, which began with some measure of hope to continue to build on the social progress that feminists and those invested in gay liberation had achieved in the 1970s. As a village people, you know, wise sages, wise bards, um, put it in ready for the 80s, a party anthem send up in anticipation of the new decade. In the 80s, we will travel far. We'll realize just who we are. We can move as one. Despite external challenges like the election of conservative Ronald Reagan in November 1980 and internal fractures within social movements, artists rallied the spirit of collective possibility in their work. So that's sort of like the beginning of the introduction to give you a sense of the range of the material in the book. And so now I'm going to turn to chapter two, um, which talks about um, Lee Mars and Roberta Gregory and goes back in time in the 70s to think about some of the challenges they're facing um, and how they're working to build community. Um, okay. Um, so some feminists rejected the aesthetics of women's comics throughout the 1970s. Some of these comics anticipated and critiqued the feminist movement's short-sightedness, especially with regard to including lesbians and women of color in the movement. Due to popular understandings of the form as a misogynist enterprise, comics existed um, at the margins of feminism and struggled for broader recognition in movement bookstores and publications. While women cartoonists broadly adopt, adopted feminist ideals in their work, the independent scene in which they created these comics, known as the underground, was populated predominantly by straight white men who often produced comics that centered retrograde and offensive depictions of women and gender relations. At this time of rich, multifarious social revolutions, there were a number of women cartoonists who frequently worked to counter the patriarchal underground ethos. Among them, cartoonists Lee Morris and Roberta Gregory were particularly important for pushing boundaries in the way they directly represented the exclusions of both the underground and feminism in their comics, illuminating why new spaces for artistic production were necessary. 
Mars and Gregory's comics were part of a lively domain of independent comics produced by women in the 1970s in coordination with a larger countercultural underground comics movement. Um, two long running feminist series emerged out of the space women's comics and tits and clits. I always love when I can say tits and clits. Great title. Um, women's comics ran for 17 issues in nearly two decades, while tits and clits ran for seven issues in a decade and a half. In that time, the series um, collectively featured the work of over 100 women cartoonists and often served as the entry point for new generations of women entering the field. While Mars and Gregory were contributors to both series, their involvement with the Women's Comics Collective across the run of the series more clearly demonstrates the depth of their participation in the comic scene. Mars was not only a founding member of the Women's Comics Collective, but also an editor of the second issue and one of the mo most prolific contributors to the series, producing images for the front and back um, covers of three issues. Gregory was notably the first openly non-heterosexual contributor depicting same-sex attraction in her first comic in the series, A Modern Romance, which appeared in Women's Comics number four. Both women contributed to over a third of the 17 issues participating across its full run. Outside these two series that operated as safe spaces for women's content, the larger underground comic scene was known for its frequent misogyny. Prominent underground cartoonist Trina Robbins, self-appointed historian of the movement, claims that it was almost de rigueur for male underground cartoonists to include violence against women in their comics and to portray this violence as humor. Working in the same medium, women's underground comics challenged misogyny as form by producing a range of liberated women's bodies on the page. In so doing, these works also pushed back against the limitations of feminist discourse in the 70s, particularly with their open focus on and embrace of many forms of sexuality. Both the Women's Comics and Tits and Clits series were important interventions that set the stage for Mars, Gregory, and countless other artists to create works elsewhere. For Mars and Gregory, their resulting individual comic books, the further fattening adventures of Pudge Girl Blimp and Dynamite Damsels, um, allowed them to specifically examine the space for women's sexuality within the feminist movement. Mars and Gregory's individual comics and their collective participation foreshadow their later trailblazing work creating representations of women's LGBTQ experiences in the gay comic series um, in the coming decade, um, and I'll discuss that at the end of this talk. In tracing the arc of their careers, we can see how their investments in multiple movements echo the shifting social landscape around them. Scholars like Hilary Chute, Susan Kirtley, Sam Meyer, Leah Meisemer, and Nicholas um, Salmond have analyzed the underground feminist comic series influence. This chapter extends those conversations by tracing how two artists who developed through the women's comics and tits and clits um, series responded to their affiliated social movements and provided a platform for emerging artists interested in LGBTQ expression, both in their individual comic books as well as their, in their foundational comics in early issues of gay comics. Despite directly engaging feminist issues. Um, and you, these quotes, I love putting them up there because they're so good, um, or they're so bad that they're good. Um, they're, these comics and artists struggled to find support from the broader women's movement. The artists contemporaneously cited how couching their political critiques in this visual, often humorously irreverent form presented an insurmountable barrier. In a 1980 interview in the Comics Journal, Robbins opined, it's really weird the way leftists and militant feminists don't seem to like comics. I think they're so hung up on their own intellect that somehow it isn't any good to them unless it's a 16 page track of gray words. Here, Robbins identified genre tunnel vision in which only text in a certain form passed ideological muster. In an interview from 79 printed in the grassroots publication, Cultural Co Correspondence, Mars expanded on the practical consequences of that prejudice but we totally got rejected by the women's movement for the most part. Not just that Ms. Magazine wouldn't run us, but bookstores across the country wouldn't carry us because we did not have a heavy traditional feminist political line. Mars equated these concrete examples with rejection for they foreclosed the ability of the collective to reach a broader feminist audience despite their varied attempts to participate. Her quotation also foregrounded their comics as something done differently from the feminist norm in their content even though later in the same interview, Mars went on to compare their comics with the working through that happened in consciousness raising groups. Notably, these feelings of frustration happened um, at the close of the decade when women broadly felt disillusioned by the promise of feminism. 
as Mars and Gregory recorded in their solo comics. Within the social landscape, Mars and Gregory's comics document the frustrations with second wave feminism by depicting the movement within their pages. The intersection of the coming of age narrative with representations of grassroots feminist organizing allowed both artists to review and critique the first half decade of women's liberation in the early 1970s. Their comics, Buildings Roman, um, Mars is the further fattening adventures of Parts Girl Blimp and Gregory's Dynamite Damsels both feature a young female protagonist coming into her own sexuality as she grows in her involvement in the feminist movement. While coming of age tells, particularly around sexual knowledge, were common in women's underground comics, Mars and Gregory's linkage of this growth to the feminist movement is relatively unique. Across their comics, they represented the early movement through its grassroots organizing spaces, consciousness raising groups, demonstrations, self-help clinics, and more, often alluding to historical reference in these moments. The close readings later on um, put these comics back into conversation with their contemporary feminist interlocutors, demonstrating the limits of these movement forms in supporting a range of women's experiences. The juxtaposition of text and image in these comics allowed them to realize and challenge more viscerally the tenets of feminism through women's own bodies. In visualizing and interrogating feminist forms, Mars and Gregory theorized new possibilities for women engaging their politics with their bodies. While Mars and Gregory's comics illustrate how much feminism in the 70s sparked sexual discovery, they also documented how the movement did not serve women who were not heterosexual, white, and middle class. Both comics featured white-coded protagonists who struggled with their sexuality, so Mars and Gregory centered critiques of how feminism did not support such women. Each artist's own personal identification as a bisexual woman also played a role in this critical focus, especially given that their comics sometimes read as semi-autobiographical accounts. In each comic, we see how feminist spaces facilitate each protagonist's first sexual experiences and embrace of non-heterosexual identities and practices. Though the characters gain sexual knowledge through intimate experiences with women affiliated with women's liberation, there were limits to how much overt um, lesbian or bisexual representation was welcomed in the movement proper. These plot points echo the early movement's struggle with lesbian feminism, as documented by Victoria Hesford in Feeling Women's Liberation, in which she charts the emergence of a new figure, the feminist as lesbian, which in turn has had a defining effect on the way in which women's liberation in particular and feminism in general has been remembered and represented. It is through this the stories of these protagonists and their struggles with squaring their same sex, de sex desire within the movement in the works of artists like Mars and Gregory that we begin to see how women were frequently disregarded due to the difference from a straight white middle class norm. Mars and Gregory's representation of race relations in both comics provided a strong counterpoint to the general lack of regard for women of color in the broader feminist movement at the time. Both artists represented women of color and black women in particular in their work more than other contemporaneous feminist media did. And in the process that they demonstrate how these women felt their concerns were not prioritized within the feminist movement. As they documented elsewhere in interviews and comics, their focus on race relations within feminism and rep representing diverse bodies arose in part out of their upbringing in the 19, in 1950s America. Gregory grew up biracial in a Southern California Latinx Caucasian household, while Mars was raised white in the South amidst the backdrop of the civil rights movement. In her book, Liberation in Print, which surveys the early feminist movement through grassroots periodicals and their affiliated collectives, Agatha Beans established how women of color often had to navigate implicit racism in dominant narratives characterizing the women's liberation movement. As Bean surveys, in the 1970s, feminists were debating the limits of sisterhood in grassroots feminist periodicals across the U.S., but comics such as Mars and Gregory's, in their position somewhat outside the movement, could comment holistically, coalescing years of movement debate in their visual forms. The coming-of-age narrative structure facilitated their critiques of how the feminist movement was heterocentric and white, dominated by showing how women had their consciousness raised through the movement, yet grew to realize its limitations. Alongside these critiques, both Mar Mars's Pudge Girl Blimp and Gregory's Dynamite Damsels simultaneously charted a pathway forward, gesturing to the conditions of possibility that would allow for the full participation of Black women and lesbians in the feminist movement. Not only did these artists lay the groundwork for future cartoonists in these comics and in their later work in the 1980s, but their concerns about feminist 
feminism's exclusions anticipate the networks that future artists created to address these issues across the, the decade. Okay. So, Hodge Girl Blimp. Um, published in three issues in the 70s, the first in 73, the second in 75, and the third in uh, 1977, Mars's The Further Fattening Adventures of Pudge Girl Blimp is, on its surface, an amusing romp in countercultural San Francisco through the eyes of a 17-year-old virgin newly arrived from the Midwest. At the center of most of the narrative, the protagonist, an unconfident and heavyset young woman, constantly faces barriers and setbacks on her ultimate quest to be deflowered. This general plot structure and its irreverent tone is in keeping with the underground comics form that Mars both adopts and critiques. Through infusing her comics form and content with feminist politics, Mars dramatically reconstitutes both Pudge and her quest over the course of the narrative. Mars renders the comic in a densely illustrated fashion that depicts Pudge within crowds as she negotiates different countercultures. All these characters exist within heavenly annotated surroundings which articulate a shared visual politics that embed Pudge's experiences among the many people and groups she encounters. As Pudge attempts to lose her virginity, she simultaneously acquires a more positive sense of her body and a more dynamic sense of what losing her virginity might mean through these interpersonal encounters. The trajectory of how she strives to lose her virginity reflects this growth of meaning as her first two failed attempts within the opening pages of the first issue involve her trying to get herself a taken advantage of and trying to take advantage of someone else, showing very little respect or thought for herself or others. After the second try, a textual panel asks if Pudge will have her consciousness raised and if she will ever see herself as whole person female. This moment, which happens on the sixth page over a hundred pages of content across three issues, marks an explicit departure from the narrative structure with which Mars begins her comic. Up until that point, her character would have easily fit into a raunchy underground comic that sexualized and objectified its women characters. Through the ser Though the series remains comical and irrever irreverent, Mars employs feminism to shift the underground narrative incrementally over the course of the three issues through the protagonist's exposure to and participation within feminist collectives. A variety of feminist collectives play a role in raising M Pudge's consciousness, transforming her relationship to sex, consent, sexuality, and her body. Her change issues from her interactions with other characters who challenge her to think more critically about her actions and more generously about herself. She accidentally encounters feminism through a self-help clinic when she finds a notice posted on a community bulletin board in the Mission neighborhood. When she enters the room, she finds women clustered around a slide presentation about their cervixes before the group breaks up to help each other perform self-examinations with speculums um, and mirrors. Quickly pulled into action, a woman helps Pudge examine her cervix in the bottom right of a panel crowded by other legs splayed in the air and accompanied by the faces of other women who assist the reclining women. Among this crowd of women, we see a diverse group all working together. Compared with her mainstream feminist contemporaries, Mars represents such collectives as more racially integrated, positioning an intersectional avant la lettre feminism as necessary for Pudge's growth. As Sheila Warren points out in her analysis of the second wave feminist documentary, Self Health, which de de depicts a group of women learning about reproductive health and performing cervical examinations together, the required solidarity of sisterhood produces the sameness in the bodies of the women who are all white. Warren evokes Carla Kaplan's work, The Erotics of Talk, which untangles how consciousness raising groups compelled homogeneity through subtle pressures to conform to particular viewpoints or to avoid taboo subjects, especially about race and class. In Mars's rendering, however, text and image strongly promote difference, especially along racial lines. Um, in the panel where various women examine their cervixes, not only do the sheer number of legs and faces accompanied by excla exclamations like, mine's pinker than yours, promote difference on the most basic level, but other comics more explicitly affirm such values. Explaining speculum use to Pudge, a Black woman facilitating the meeting declares, you see, everyone, every woman looks different inside. Through these differences, Mars embraces heterogeneity rather than enforcing a sisterhood of sameness. In illustrating this collective, Mars not only creates a self-help group 
um, with more progressive politics than mainstream depictions, but also comically renders a contemporary moment of feminist history. In September 1972, Los Angeles police arrested Carol Downer and a number of other women who had been leading self-help workshops on the rationale that these services constitute unlicensed medical practice. Because Downer had been charged with helping treat women's yeast infections with yogurt, the case became known as the Great Yogurt Conspiracy, as a report of the case in the feminist newspaper Off Our Backs called it. In the aftermath of Downer's acquittal and the attendant press coverage, a 2004 article in Feminist Studies understands this case as the now comical police bust over yogurt. By alluding to this moment in feminist history, Mars connects to her feminist readers and suggests that her comic and character are part of that history. While the seizure in the comic, uh, or well, actually in, in reality too, uh, of strawberry yogurt that was a staff member's lunch and not intended for the treatment of yeast infections is already uh, funny, Mars heightens this humor in her account of the event. In these panels, a character resembling Downer suggests yogurt as a treatment method, prompting an undercover cop to cry out, you're all under arrest while trying to yank up her pants and ineffectually search her purse for her badge. Although the actual arrest happened in a police raid, this rendering captures the humorous manner in which the event was received by the general public. Mars conveys her support of feminism by heightening the ridiculousness of the cops in this telling. This self-help clinic exposes Pudge to more perspectives and open dialogues about women's bodies and pleasures before she joins a consciousness raising group, which she faithfully attends over the rest of the series. Pudge's participation in a consciousness raising a group across all three issues shapes her perspective about her eventual sexual encounters. Through the depiction of these group settings, Mars creates a space for conversation while simultaneously foreclosing the possibility of fully engaging any one woman's issues. In her introduction to the group in Pudge Girl Blimp number one, Mars fashions a spacious lack of listening by fracturing sequential paneling um, the recursive flow of the women's conversation sets the panel spiraling. At the center of this spiral, Mars insets a start arrow, as if to suggest a deliberate order to read from inside out. However, this order clashes with the traditional left to right movement of the page, which is still in play. The first and final rows are not canted into the spiral structure. These two conflicting orders underline the directionless movement of the group's conversations. In each section of the panel, or each section of panel, we see a different woman speaking of her gendered frustrations. And in the spiraled section, these moments um, overlap each other so that the women's sentiments cannot be deciphered in full. In other panels, characters trail off in ellipses such that no thought is closed or resolved, regardless of whether fully spoken on the page. Just like Mars's depiction of the women's self-help group where panels were filled with many voices and bodies, here we see various groupings and conversations afloat as Pudge makes her first introductions. As the panels start to spiral, these voices are fragmented into their own panels, verbalizing their frustrations without any space for real response. In a space outside the tilted panels, Mars, Mars annotates the encounter, the weeks go on. So what we're seeing, particularly in the center spiral, is not one consciousness raising session, but many. The women circumnavigate their ideas amid a crowded audience. The sequence acts as a temporal montage, fast forwarding us through Pudge's first consciousness raising sessions, underlining her participation and suggesting with a temporal marker, her potential growth at the sequence's end. Since her interactions with the consciousness raising group occur within the last few pages, of the first comic it is not until the second issue that the personal impact on Pudge can be tracked. That is Pudge, a girl blimp number two is the issue in which we can start, can start to see how the seeds of feminism planted in the first comic are starting to shift Pudge's actions and goals. She continues to interact with the group in scattered moments that punctuate the text, indexing how the group becomes as much a part of, as much of a continual presence in her life as her goal to lose her virginity. When we see Pudge spend extended time um, with the consciousness raising group, the formal panel layout begins to spiral once again. Unlike the inside out spiral Pudge Girl Blimp number one that conflicted with the left to right reading of the top panels, the spiral reads outside in, moving more seamlessly from the top row of panels across a page. Here, rather than indicating multiple sessions, arrows lead the reader 
through a single spiraling conversation in which the women discuss their anger. Because of the many women in attendance, no one woman can do much more than simply register her anger, suggesting this group as a place to start consciousness raising, but not one that will allow for full processing. This spiral is simpler in its specified direction and illustration of one session, yet both spirals mark the women's space as formally discrete from the rest of the comic. Not only are these spiraling panels distinct, but also in their troubling of traditional panel layout and subsequent overlapping and simultaneous collapsing of voices and moments, they are destructive to the comics page. While these spirals evoke the psychedelic culture that was often part of the underground scene, um, the sense of disruption also resonates with the notion of ecriture feminine developed contemporaneously in Helene Sisu's The Laugh of the Medusa. Women take pleasure in jumbling the order of space, in disorienting it, in changing around the furniture, dislocating things and values, breaking them all up, emptying, emptying structures, and turning propriety upside down. A feminine text cannot fail to be more than subversive. It is volcanic. As it is written, it brings about an upheaval of the old property crust, carrier of masculine investments. There's no other way. This order emanates not just out of the writing, but also out of the women themselves, whose deep conversations jumpstart the spirals as they perform the gesture that Sisu enumerates. They rhetorically jumble the order of space by reconsidering their values and reflect on how they have already emptied structures through changes instigated in their group discussions. While this volcanic force only brings about an upheaval of the format of two pages, its energy suffuses the rest of the plot, redirecting Pudge's focus. Not only do these moments of feminist collectivity change Pudge's trajectory in the way she eventually achieves her goal, but also the series itself with a lusty um, yet unconventionally uh, attract, attractive, unattra uh, yet conventionally unattractive and unconfident protagonist challenges a whole subset of misogynist underground comics featuring graphically attractive women drawn for the purposes of objectification in sexual situations. Uh, through these representations, Mars subtly disrupts the prevailing structures that constrain and contain comics and suggests innovative possibilities for the form and the characters therein. Moreover, this feminist sensibility shapes how Mars's or how Pudge's eventual encounters with sexuality are illustrated and how Pudge participates in them outside of the received beliefs with which she begins her narrative. At first, her feminist engagement seems to act as a potential hindrance to her goal as she rejects the further advances of her first suitor, Jethro, an undercover cop who devalues her as a suspect when their vehic vehicular twist is interrupted by other policemen. However, her personal growth in the consciousness raising group opens Pudge up to a more wide ranging and satisfying engagement with her sexuality. Her next two partners demonstrate more progressive mindsets, Jane, a lesbian in her, in her consciousness raising group and Skeets, a straight male activist. Her sexual connection with these two partners moves beyond the simplistic quest of losing her virginity, and this change underlines her evolving ideas. From her continuing explorations in feminism, she has gained a sense of self-worth and bodily respect for herself and her partners. Both of these sexual experiences transpire in the third issue. Her encounter with a woman, however, which happens within the first few pages, shapes the arc of the installment, setting the tone for the heterosexual encounters to follow. With Jane, Pudge first experiences an orgasm, and during the, the shared intimacy, the two women discuss Pudge's initial fraught forays with men. For Mars, lesbian desire nestles comfortably alongside both the feminist movement and heterosexuality and amplifies Pudge's conceptions of sexuality. In Mars's multi-page depiction of Pudge's intimacy with Jane, she shows both women actively exploring the contours of each other's bodies for the purposes of pleasure. Pudge's experience is especially heightened, likely because this represents her fuller, first full sexual encounter with another person and therefore fulfills her goal, although, albeit not in a manner she could have originally conceived of. When Pudge turns to satisfy Jane, um, Pudge's figure occupies most of the panel as you watch her eager and curious face learning how to give pleasure. Um, Pudge also dominates the panel space during her own orgasm, which we see here. As Jane um, disappears, we zoom into a row of three panels that show Pudge's orgasm as a fire in her loins that races up her body and shoots out the tips of her hair into a star-filled eruption. In the orgasmic moments, bodies devolve into psychedelic wavy lines surrounded by stars and curved shapes. When Pudge later sleeps with Skeets on multiple occasions, her pleasures there stylistically echo and therefore, 
thereby refer back to those with Jane. While this narrative in three parts begins as a comical over-the-top sexual conquest, Mars employs feminism in the form of collectives to nuance Pudge's trajectory and sexuality. On the very last page of her comic following her birthday, Pudge thinks forward to her future. Here she realizes, I can be anything at all, picturing career trajectories in six circular panels that overlap each other and the rectangular panels. This revelation results from her new progressive politics rather than the loss of her virginity. These realizations forecast career possibilities now open to women because of feminism. The six imagined scenarios not only speak to feminism's impact on real women, but also open up new narratives for female characters. As Pudge raises her consciousness and the series therefore moves away from misogynist dick plot, Pudge's story can be read both as her personal buildings romance as well as a treatise to underground comics in treating change. Okay, so Dynamite Damsels. Um, on the front cover of Dynamite Damsels, Roberta Gregory positions her comic in relation to the watershed moments within the feminist movement. While the front covers of the further fattening adventures of Pudge Girl Blimp always centrally situate Pudge in the middle of a crowded cult countercultural San Francisco milieu that wraps around onto the back cover, Gregory's protagonist Frida is decentered. Both the front and back covers of Dynamite Damsels illustrate collectives of women representing the feminist movement. The contrasting placement of the protagonist is suggestive of how they encounter and convey feminism to their readers. In Mars's story, Pudge is solidly the main character. These are her adventures, and she serves as a node through which we learn not only about feminism, but also about other countercultures that crowd around her on the covers. For Gregory's text, although Frida is a protagonist, the covers spatially locate feminism as a main character. Frida changes and grows throughout the narrative, but her transformation simultaneously tells feminism's story for which Frida acts as a filter. While Pudge Groblem functions as an introductory primer to feminism, showing how it can positively reshape someone's experience, Dynamite Damsel speaks to those already in the feminist movement and depicts its shortcomings. Gregory formulates this critique both through the experiences of the characters and how she illustrates those happenings. Like Mars, Gregory's pages are dense, but text rather than bodies commands space. That is, the women process their feminism through sizable speech and thought bubbles that entangle them and crowd their bodies. Even moments of pleasure are mediated through and curtailed by feminist rhetoric on the page. While feminism provides these women with the initial platform to raise their consciousness, we can see on the page itself how it becomes a stifling force. Together, both comics outline, outline the potential of the feminist movement while also locating in their representations the seeds for change. By referencing key texts and moments within the feminist movement, Gregory both celebrates and challenges feminism through her irreverent representation. The cover depicts the protagonist dreaming of a group of armored women riding horses and carrying the banner of feminism on shields that show um, the female symbol um, with a fist inside the circle. This symbol had become an icon of feminist empowerment when it was chosen for the cover of one of the first widely available mass market anthologies, a women's liberation movement, um, Sisterhood is Powerful, which came out in 1970 and which was edited by Robin Morgan. On both Gregory's and Morgan's covers, the centrally located symbol pulsates in red. In addition to referencing Morgan's anthology, the cover of Dynamite Damsels inscribes another contemporaneous event. In May, 1970, at the Second Congress to Unite Women, a group of lesbians took over the stage prior to the opening session, demanding that lesbianism be accepted by the Congress following Betty Friedan's recent admonition of lesbians as a lavender menace. The protesters wore t-shirts bearing the phrase lavender menace across the bust and held up signs that proclaimed the women's movement is a lesbian plot. This action led to late, greater lesbian visibility and to the National Organization of Women passing legislation in favor of lesbians in the following year. Gregory's cover humorously revises this key moment in early feminism. As Frida dreams, her cat pumpkin stays awake, wondering, is the women's movement really a lesbian plot? Although the Lavender Menace succeeded in its immediate goal, Gregory suggests that over a, a half a decade later, lesbians' relationship with feminism remains open to debate by transforming the exclamation into a quiet, question quietly considered by a cat. By unraveling this query in the narrative, Gregory presciently previews one of the conflicts that would further erode the cohesion of the women's movement in the 80s. The major narrative within um, the self-published Dynamite Damsels is divided into 19 vignettes that primarily resolve around Frida's sexual awakening and her commitments 
as a feminist activist, though they sometimes also focus on other key characters. Following a couple of prefatory comics, the story begins in the middle of a feminist consciousness racing session as Frida brings a black woman, Edie, who is interested in joining the group. Edie asks about the whiteness of the feminist movement and participates in the session after she's quickly answered, but there is an uneasiness to this exchange among the members and the group forecloses a fuller consideration of race. The women then turn to discuss sex in this and subsequent sessions so that this vignette entitled uh, Group Dynamics Positions Sex, Not Race, as a main vector of interest for the feminist plot. The marginalized role of race within this feminist group foreshadows the frictions that Frida faces as her sexuality shifts, as well as the work that feminists of color would continue to do in the following decade to challenge the perceived centrality of whiteness within the movement. As the group discusses sex, Frida, the 23-year-old virgin protagonist, has little co to contribute and blushes at her admission of inexperience. Three vignettes later, however, Frida meets Doris, a stereotypical masculine dyke who jumpstarts Frida's sexual desires. Frida negotiates her burgeoning um, sexual feelings through textual rhetoric. As this more prominent text often limits figural representation, much of the comic is told through reactive faces rather than fuller forms. Even moments of intimacy are crowded by sizable speech and thought bubbles, unlike Pudge Girl Blimp, where text recedes to make space for bodies on the page. The sheer volume of words on the page um, becomes stifling when Frida contemplates her sexual and activist identity while she's alone in bed, suffering from sleepless, sleeplessness in two vignettes aptly titled Insomnia 1 and Insomnia 2. In the first vignette, Frida names feminism as a reason she cannot sleep, reflecting that she has so much on her mind now that her consciousness has been raised. When she finally falls asleep, a dream of embracing Doris wakes her abruptly and her whole body reveals her feelings as she viscerally reacts she gasps and trembles, her heart pounds, and her cheeks flush. Her immediate thoughts, not again, I gotta stop having those dreams, disclose that this is not the first time that she's had this dream. The fact that this comic vignette starts and ends with the same panel reinforces this ceaseless repetition. In the penultimate panel, a dejected Frida rests her head on her hand, mulling over the implications of this fantasy, first wondering, am I ODing on feminism? Following thoughts, Am I carrying it, i.e. feminism, to its logical conclusion, corroborate that her politics may have germinated this desire? Yet she manifests discomfort with how these feelings challenge her politics, causing her to ask, I thought I was open-minded. Why then can't I accept my own feelings? Hell. She cannot escape the contradictory considerations that collapse around her. She cannot push them to the side of the panel. These solitary moments of feminist self-reflection illustrate the feminist battle cry that the personal is political, by unfurling the political and hefty speech bubbles in the most intimate of spaces, Frida's bedroom. And this, in her following bout of insomnia, Frida endeavors to synthesize her feelings and her politics, yet she cannot find any reprieve from the words on the page. In Insomnia 2, Frida experiences broader feminist discontent. Here she tallies the difficult economics of being a full-time act feminist activist after a tough and demoralizing demonstration. Her textual worries dominate even more of the page space in the second episode. In a close-up panel, Frida gazes with furrowed brow directly out at the reader, wondering if she could make a difference by writing another book full of rhetoric. In Insomnia 1, as she attempts to resolve her earlier sleeplessness, she initially turns to her bookshelf, but quickly tosses a work of feminism over her right shoulder, deciding, I don't want to read any feminist rhetoric right now. Her visceral response to femi feminism in both Insomnia 1 and Insomnia 2 bespeaks her fatigue with the movement, and the qualifying adjectives, another and any, collapse the vibrancy of feminist voices into a dull chain of sameness. Yet this feminism is her life force. Through Frida, rhetoric lives and breathes on these pages. Is Frida's direct gaze in Insomnia too, as she considers writing a book, an autobiographical rupturing of the fourth wall? Is Dynamite Damsel's Gregory's book full of rhetoric? And is that even possible if it's in comics form? If anything, although Gregory's comics uh, form is overrun with textual rhetoric, her pages confront these words, illustrating their potential stranglehold on bodies and discourse, while also working through this impasse in a different medium that allows body and language to reckon directly with each other. Parsing her life run by feminist rhetoric, Frida tosses and turns in bed. The comics page heightens this motion by alternatively, alternately zooming in and out from a variety of angles on her frustrated face. In Insomnia 2, Frida tackles her feminism face-to-face, -face, or rather face-to-thought bubble, and her circular ruminations achieve forward motion in the following vignette when she admits her lesbian feelings. 
The vignette, a nocturnal interlude between leading a feminist demonstration and coming out, allows Frida to relate the tangible issues that undergird her daily existence apart from these climactic instances. In a second bout of insomnia, she faces her feminist hardships before her sexuality propels her into renegotiating the terms of her political engagement. Uh, in her waking life, her commitment to feminism brings her fulfillment, but she also feels compelled to deny her sexual orientation. The strain reaches a breaking point at the center of the narrative during a feminist demonstration that Frida leads, which is portrayed across three pages in the Unity Show, which is the longest vignette in the comic. This demonstration immediately precedes her second bout of insomnia. Before the march begins, Frida is unabashedly positive, blushing at the thought of the feminist action while clasping her hands and verbalizing, sisterhood is beautiful, oh God, I'm so jazzed, it's just like the early days of the movement. Her burgeoning sexual desire prompts her blushing earlier in the narrative, likening it to a joyous post-coital glow. In these panels, she is positively bubbly, gushing, we've got to get them all together and then turn them into fanatical feminists rather than bothered by any of her insomniac concerns. When the march starts, Frida's exuberance builds and she proclaims, it's beautiful, it's beautiful and perfect. Mid-demonstration, her mounting energy climaxes as she floats above the crowd with her arms open and eyes closed, surrounded by stars and the um, female symbol. In the following panel, her fellow feminists gaze on her bliss, confirming the sexual undertones by declaring her positively orgasmic. This moment represents the first time that Frida finds release when flushed. At this point, Frida is still entering into se sexual self-knowledge, but she finds equivalent fulfillment through her organizing. Yet in the following panels, the demonstration takes a turn for the worse as female counter-protesters start to assault Frida physically. In their accompanying verbal attacks, they notably deride Frida and her compatriots with stereotypes saying, they're probably all lesbians and no karate. This event crushes Frida's spirit since she tried to play it straight for the purposes of the march and is aware that homophobia is also replicated within her feminist group. Following this difficult march and the anxiety and agitation of her sleepless night, Frida comes out as a lesbian, an admission that radically reconfigures her relationship to feminism. Throughout, feminism leaves little space for Frida's newfound sexuality, and this is no more evident than when she receives a phone call during an intimate moment. The telephone rings as she is in bed discussing lesbian relationships with Doris and her partner, thinking to herself, what a beautiful moment if it could only last forever. The ring splays vertically between panels, viscerally cutting off the intimate exchange from he Frida's harried conversation about the women's center in the next panel. Two very different Fridas exist on either side of the ring. By this point in the story, she's fed up with feminism such that these phone calls are strenuous affairs. The feminism on the phone calls her into unhealthy sacrifice and no longer recognizes her fully. In response to the phone call, she sends Doris, the most visibly lesbian character, in her stead. She has already come out to her fellow feminists, but by answering the call with Doris, Frida learns that they do not embrace her new identity and community as fully as they claim. The final two pages culminate in a face-off between Frida's feminism and her lesbianism through the figure of Doris. When Doris arrives at the Women's Center to fill in for Frida, the women literally shove her into a closet to hide her, not wanting her to appear in a television show they are filming about the center. Although they do not physically accost Doris, their actions echo those that Frida suffers at the march when hateful women try to silence her. When Frida arrives and learns what has happened to Doris, her response is to quit her work with the Women's Center and leave the consciousness raising group, opting, opting to take time to reassess her own identity independent of activist work. Frida's actions are not a full-scale rejection of feminism, but a recalibration. Her soul-searching transformation throughout the comic illustrates the malleable mentality that feminism must strive for if it does not want to alienate its lesbian sisters, not to mention women of color. If Pudge Girl Blimp acts as a treatise to underground comics and feminist newcomers, then Dynamite Damsels is a didactic manual for feminism depicting methods of alienation to avoid. In the comic's visuality, Gregory wields feminist rhetoric and associates it with bodies, indexing who commands which rhetorics to both include and exclude. Okay, and now for my final act tonight, um, gay comics. So following these solo works, Gregory and Mars kept making comics within the underground publishing scenes, frequently contributing to women's comics and tits and clips comic series. Um, in these comics, both artists continue to explore themes related to women's sexuality, but it is their groundbreaking work um, in the gay comics series that would make space for new generations of lesbian and bisexual women cartoonists similarly invested in the project of visually representing women's sexuality. Gay comics was notably the first comic series to feature both gay men and lesbian 
lesbians in its pages, the editors aim to balance that content in addition to seeking out additional representation from across the gender and sexual spectrum. Running for 25 issues across two decades from 1980 to 1998, Gay Comics featured the work of over 100 artists and served as a launching point for a number of emerging artists. Having a dedicated space where women could explore LGBTQ themes helped facilitate a boom in lesbian comics in the 1990s, as this section illustrates. Both Mars and Gregory began participating in the series from the first issue. Their contributions solicited by underground cartoonist Howard Cruz, who served as editor of the series for the first four issues. Along with underground veteran Mary Wings, Mars and Gregory outlined a capacious understanding of female homosexuality in gay comics number one, providing generous groundwork for future artists to examine wide ranging facets of such experiences. In that initial issue, Mars and Gregory both produced comics that harked back to their earlier comics, yet expanded the narrative exploration of sexuality past the coming of age beginnings of Pudge Girl Blimp and Dynamite Damsels. Their brief comics tackled adult sexuality and showed how sexuality is a fluid evolving dynamic across many years that can be shaped by the community around you. With the eight page stick in the mud, which opens the volume, Mars traced the love life of a bisexual woman, Susan, from her early childhood all the way through to domestic bliss with Carol, illustrated in the final panel where the two relax together in rocking chairs on their porch, knitting and discussing upcoming social plans while the cat naps between them. Whereas Pudge emerges from her narrative as an 18-year-old with an evolved sense of sexuality who contemplates her future career, Susan struggles with her sexuality for years from her adolescence through her adult life. She yo-yos from one failed love to another, cycling through a range of relationship types with lovers of different genders. This non-linear narrative progression shows Mars drawing on while simultaneously upending the tropes of the romance comic, a popular mid-century form that narrated how a young woman found fulfilling heterosexual love with one perfect partner. Mars dispenses the possibility of a traditional heterosexual pairing for her protagonist early on, illustrating the courtship, marriage, and divorce in less than one page, following the depiction of failed female loves and preceding some years of a tumultuous swinging lifestyle. Though through subverting the expectations and linearity of the romance comic, Mars makes visible the romantic difficulties for a person who falls outside of accepted sexual norms, yet in the ultimate subversion of the genre, she offers up a happy ending where the protagonist finds herself in a stable, committed relationship, but with a woman. A few stories later in the same issue, Gregory's five-page piece, Reunion, starts from a point that coalesces the beginning and ending of Dynamite Damsels, creating a viable lesbian feminist community over the course of the comic. We begin again with the consciousness raising session, but here, when one woman comes out to the group, not only is she accepted by the group, but the comic also traces how this disclosure positively alters the life path for two of her fellow groupmates as they work up the courage to seek female par partners also. The comic follows the three women through their love lives until they all bump into each other um, at a women's concert six years later. This concert is the realization of lesbian feminist community that Frida wasn't sure was possible when she left her women's group at the end of Dynamite Damsels. Three parallel panels that you can see here at the end of the comic show each woman impressed by the other two while they reflect on how they're still figuring out their own life. The wording of each woman's thought bubble is virtually the same, demonstrating the validity of each path and refusing to judge one woman's experience as more or less evolved. Gregory's image for the back cover of that first issue of Gay Comics shares this ethos as she interweaves six scenes of men and women um, openly expressing and being accepted for their homosexual identities under text that proclaims, when you're in love, the whole world is lavender. In the space of a few pages each, these comics, together with Mars's piece, illustrate a multifaceted range of sexual practices and relationship types, um, opening up the space to tell all sorts of stories of sexuality across the run of the series. Numerous women soon join them, inspired by their work here and in subsequent issues. While Wings and Mars helped define the developing series in the first several issues, Gregory shaped the voice of the publication over the course of its entire run. Across its 25 issues, Gregory was the most frequent female contributor with pieces in over three quarters of the issues and with half of Gay Comics number 21 solely uh, devoted solely to her work. In addition to influencing the career of Alison Bechtel, Gay Comics um, inspired many other women to contribute in subsequent issues, such that the series shifted from portraying the perspectives of veteran underground cartoonists to sharing the work of a younger generation of emerging cartoonists. This new cohort of lesbian cartoonists included women who would broaden the landscape of lesbian comics in the 90s with continuing series and collections and encompass, collections encompassing strips drawn from the working gay comics, as well as from grassroots newspapers and zines. The most frequent um, female contributors after 
Gregory, Jennifer Camper, Leslie Ewing, Joan Hilty, and Andrea Natalie embody this publishing en en energy and fashioning of a lesbian comics landscape. Starting with Gay Comics number two, um, Camper published in over half the issues of the series, while Ewing, Hilty, and Natalie began particip participating in the mid to late 1980s, with each artist contributing to roughly a quarter of the issues. All four artists published in a variety of grassroots periodicals across the nation, but it was the gay comic series that brought them together in print, as in Gay Comics number 14, which featured the work of all four artists inside an issue whose fantasy-inspired cover by Gregory depicted a pair of lesbian mermaids, a male fawn cavorting with a male centaur, and a lipstick reptile in dress, heels, wig, and tiara, whom a nearby unicorn gazes on quizzically, wondering if she is a dragon queen. <laughs> of course, right? All four artists would appear together again in the final issue, Gate Comics number 25, which brought together 76 of the contributors from across the series for a last hurrah, but their varied work in the series was in dialogue with a wide array of artists as the editors continued to welcome new voices. Not only did their artistic contributions map out new facets of LGBTQ life from their perspective as women, but Camper, Ewing, Hilty, and Natalie were also actively community building through the work they took on alongside the comics they created. That is, their additional community work created infrastructure for future cartoonists and also supported larger queer populations. After a decade of publishing mainly one-off strips that demonstrated her interest in representing LGBTQ community as a multifaceted intersectional space, Camper curated a selection of these works in Rude Girls and Dangerous Women. This collection gestured towards her interest in community building, which would later manifest in her editorship of two comics anthologies, Juicy Mother and Juicy Mother 2 where she brought together a range of established and emerging queer creators. Ewing's recurring, mid um, recurring strip mid Dyke Crisis, which she published both in issues of women's comics and gay comics, represented lesbian relationship dynamics in the contemporary moment and often touched on the HIV AIDS epidemic, echoing her deep involvement in activism. She organized in the late 1980s the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt and continued thereafter to work in the same sector, including for over a decade as executive director of the Pacific Center, an LGBTQ organization located in Berkeley, California. Following publishing comics about lesbian life and even creating a lesbian superhero team, Hilty turned to work in mainstream comics variously as an editor, writer, and artist and was with DC's Vertical imprint when Gay Comics number 25 briefly profiled her career in the history of all the contributors of the series they produced, uh, especially for that final issue. Natalie founded the Lesbian Cartoonist Network in the 1990, which fought, fostered community for lesbian cartoonists through a newsletter that provided production and publishing resources. In addition to this work, she also published a number of collections of her single panel Stonewall Riots comics in the early 90s as Stonewall Riots, The Night Audrey's Vibrator Spoke, and Ruby Fruit Mountain. All these women were also featured in the collection of lesbian comics that Roz Warren edited, Dyke Strippers, Lesbian Cartoonist A to Z. Warren saw this volume as one that would gather together lesbian and bisexual cartoonists and make their work more broadly known beyond the regional gay and lesbian papers in which they published. Over half of the 35 women including in Dyke, included in Dyke Strippers also published work in the gay comic series at one point or another, demonstrating how well the series supported and represented the population. In creating gay comics, editor Howard Cruz built a bridge between the underground and LGBTQ lives, drawing out those artists who had been representing these experiences at the edge of the counterculture and welcoming an artist from elsewhere, including those who had been producing comics in grassroots feminist and gay and lesbian newspapers. Though Pudge, Girl Blimp, and Dynamite Damsels may have been outliers in the underground, Mars and Gregory were central in inspiring future generations of artists in this new context. The capacious vision which they charted out the contours of sexuality in their comics in the underground allowed them to foster an even wider platform of possibility for this comic series. As Cruz wrote at the end of his editor's note for the initial issue, there's more to gay experience that can be chronicled in 36 pages, so this one's just for starters, have fun. The sentiment eschews the possibility of being able to definitively represent all facets of same gender attraction and similar remarks were found in each subsequent issue welcoming new participants. The work of the cartoonist further extended that welcome, making good on Cruz's opening remarks by offering representations that move beyond stereotypes to delve into the nuanced contours of sexual experience. Thank you so much. And that's all I got. <laughs> that, oh, uh, okay, great. Am I unmuted? Yes. yes. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, 
can you un stop sharing? I think yes. at this point. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for that. That was an uh, an amazing presentation. I loved how it kind of started out. Uh, you know, by going into this archive of of um, uh, you know, principally comics having to do with the lesbian and queer experience. You start out with these people who are part of these networks, these you know early you know second wave feminist networks who are cartoonists and have, you know, kind of chronicle that from the inside out and the ways in which they do and don't uh, uh, kind of fit into those networks. And then by the end, we see how once a critical mass of queer cartoonists has been achieved, they can start to form their own networks, um, you know, to the, uh, you know, that, that speak maybe to the cartoonist as a kind of identity as well um, uh, within all those intersexual identities, um, you know, being like a little humorous there, but, you know, that's, that's kind of a funny thing. And I, I do think there is maybe something about, too, about the, um, the sort of, uh, Maybe the way that that uh, you know cartooning is such a in kind of individualized and almost like subversive and solitary sort of activity that maybe the cartoonist is doomed to be the, a misfit in any group except a group of cartoonists too. <laughs> um, but I, I did want to ask a couple of, uh, of questions, and I know that there's one in the chat. Um, but the first thing I wanted to ask, which is something that interests me, you know, I was thinking at one point, you know, about. Um, in a way, kind of ongoing, particularly, I guess, ongoing topical series like Dykes to Watch Out For, as as an example, um, you know, like you're in a way, um, you know, do function as a kind of archive themselves, right? Like we live, especially now more than ever, in this super super intense news cycle, and sometimes it's like you know, things that happened like six months ago feel like they happened six years ago. And, and you know, things that, you know, dominated our attention for some period of time, you know, become very quickly forgotten. Um, and certainly going through this material, um, in a way, what you see is a kind of archive of things that were topical concerns at any given moment, even, for example, um, in the uh, Pudge the Girl blimp comic that you showed where there's a reference to the um uh the police bust uh, of that uh um uh you know self the I, I forget what the name of the um session was but the you know the self-exam uh session that, that was being organized there or even on the cover of um dynamite damsels the reference to that intervention you know the the reference to you know are is feminism just a lesbian plot for example you know so i know you're you work a lot with archives the cover of the book yeah, the title of the book rather is invisible archives so there is something about archives there's something in a way about how the archive is a network of information and that relates to these network networks of individuals but i'm wondering in what ways maybe you feel that like a a fictionalized narrative work like Pudge Girl Blimp or, you know, Dynamite Damsels or, you know, maybe the ongoing, you know, adventures of, of some of these characters like, you know, Bitchy Bitch or whatever, or Butchy Butch or whatever. Um, well, you know, you can take your pick. There are many examples. To what extent they do and don't maybe function like archives, uh, even if they're, they're not consciously um, uh, intended to be, say, journalistic projects per se? Yeah, great, great question. So the portion of this chapter that I didn't um, share was about the archives, right? And so the, the mm -hmm. main sort of, uh, the main um, argument there sort of parallels what I'm saying about Mars and Gregory's comics in that they were sort of, um, you know, at this intersection between the underground and the feminist movement and not really accepted fully by either. Um, mm -hmm. in some ways. And so that also then echoes how they are then sort of collected into archives and how they're remembered. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things I say is that we, one of the things we should do is like look across different archival collections and see how they've been collected, right? To understand mm -hmm. sort of the proclivities of different collectors um, and how they're remembered um, because archives are not just neutral spaces where things are are there, but um, how people collect and how things are described and how they're put into finding guides really sort of shapes um, the comics, but also the comics themselves, as you do say, and something I want to show um, was that they do also embed or document these moments of um, these historical reference. And they were really fun 
I hope they were fun for you to hear, but they're really fun for me to like um, dig these things back up because these were things that were, you know, um, people were joking about at the time, but they're not like big, like who remembers a great yogurt conspiracy? I mean, I hope you all now do and you will remember and commit this to memory because it's fantastic historical tidbit. Um, but there are these things that have um, just like they're in the archive of the comic, but they have sort of been forgotten until we can then reactivate them, right? Um, and it's not just also the fun thing about the comic is it's not just, uh, you know, uh, dry documentation it's humorous and it's playing with and sort of in some ways embedding reactions to how people would have received these these um items they would have laughed um at this um los angeles police department bus and then mars is like well how can i heighten those moments of um of reaction and also one of the things to remember too is like in terms of these comics i mean the individual issues I'm talking about, the solo works, they're going to be produced, they're going to take longer time to produce, but when you're producing things in like newspapers and things like that, you're going to be responding to what's happening at that time. And so there's a way that you can um, more directly respond to the news of the day and the current events and put that into the comic than if someone's making like a graphic novel for years and years and years and years and years. So the form also um, facilitates that sort of connection to the present moment. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great uh, that's a great response, and and definitely that is worth thinking about too. The kind of production cycle of you know doing a weekly or biweekly comic strip like Dykes to watch out for versus you know I I don't know what the frequency of Pudge Girl Blimp was, but I'm I'd be surprised if it was more than one issue a year, right? Yeah, it's like one every two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't know. I don't I don't want to um uh pick on anyone. Um. But I, I, I think we have at least one of the artists whose work you talked about uh, here in the audience today. Um, it looks like Roberta is maybe with us. Roberta, are you able to um, speak or, or at, at all? Hello? Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Hi, thanks for being oh, with us. Sure, let's see, here I am. I didn't wanna put you on the spot or anything. But uh, I, I mean, I, is I, I would just thought since uh, you know we're, we're looking at your work, how do you feel about um, uh, you know folks reading this work that you made uh, as kind of a way of accessing maybe chapters of uh, radical history that preceded them? Well, I mean, it's definitely a snapshot of a point in time. I mean, it's, I haven't read that in years. I mean, I actually found little box I thought I was completely out of them I actually found a little box of them so there actually are some dynamite damsels that still exist but um yeah it's like I was I didn't remember some of the things I put in it that Margaret was describing it's like I say it's, it was a spin-off of a or an offshoot of a little strip I had in the it was like a bi-weekly paper in university so the like I say it was just basically a spin off of the um women's resource center at university that's wonderful well thank you so much again i don't, I didn't want to put you on the spot but thank you so much for uh for being with us today and i think that's oh, like just, one of the kind of nice from, like very unusual things about this the, something like this symposium is that uh you've got artists and scholars and you know just attentive readers and all kinds of people in the same room together well, it really reminded me how like groundbreaking gay comics was. I mean, if ever anything needed to be like produced in a as a facsimile, that would that would be really, I think, eye-opening to people to see how different mm -hmm. things were what 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. No, that's a that's a very good point. And I think that's actually a good um transition too to bring up one of the questions um in the chat here. Um, and uh, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your, your name, uh, mate. Um, uh, have us posted a question here that has to do precisely with the uh, encountering these texts in different formats. Uh, would you like to um, ask that question directly, or would you prefer if I just read the question that's written in the chat here? Sure, I can ask. Um, are you. you all able to hear me? Yes, absolutely. 
Hi, it's good to see you, Margaret. Thank you for this brilliant talk. Um, I'm Maite, and I'm wondering about, about collecting um, these comics. So there's recent, somewhat recently been uh, women's comics, Tits and Clits just came out like in the past year, I think, and then Dykes to watch out for. So I'm wondering uh, like if it and how it makes a difference in terms of how these comics are read and circulated and received and how do you sort of navigate that in your own archival research while also thinking about visibility and accessibility? Yeah, so th uh, that's a great question. I mean, these things, I love to teach them and, uh, but they're, you know, um often out of print although the the fanographics collections of women's comics and tits and clits are fantastic and one of the things that both those do is they reprint like every single page right they reprint them as they were reprinted one of the things i think they do that also to um don't quote me on this but i think it's something about permissions too they have permissions to reprint them this way and so they have permissions again to reprint them as they were and they don't get into some um quandaries with that many um creators um, and so those are fantastic, but what I've also done um, is try to collect individual issues. Um, and that's hard to do. I think I have every issue of women's comics. I don't have every issue of tits and clits. Um, like I have every issue of gay comics. It took a while. It's I have like a, get, a eBay save search. And, mm -hmm. and when something comes up that's um, inexpensive or I go to, um, like for instance, to random comic shops in different places. So if you're ever in um, Athens, Georgia, um, this is a shout out for a friend on the call. You got to go to Bazaar Wex Street, um, which I found like, I think I spent $400, which is a lot of money, but I had like a stack, a huge stack of comics. And I found like Gay Comics Number 9, which is an issue focused on um, Jerry Mills's poppers. Jerry Mills, um, died of HIV AIDS in 93 into this amazing sort of comic about sort of gay liberation scene, um, which is very um, joyous. Um, that usually online, I don't see it for anything less than like $50 and it was like $9, right, at this place. So it's, you know, in person um, searching, I have the spreadsheet on your phone, um, but I get these issues not just so I can have them, but so I can bring them into my classroom and share them with students. And so sometimes I will pick up multiple issues, um, but I want them to have the experience of like engaging with these. So, you know, sure, I'll put the women's comics and tits and clits, the volumes on reserve, but I want them to understand the like um, the physical copies. I also have, um, you know, digital copies of th some things as well. Um, but I think it's, you know, important to um, to like engage with them as they were. And so, you know, a lot of these, even if they're uh, in completely collected, they do exist in collections in a lot of different collections, a lot of different archival spaces. Um, and so there are opportunities um, for folks to engage with them um, in those spaces as well, right? Um, but definitely an eBay save search. Um, and I can't tell, but I feel like women's comics, since it's been collected, maybe it's easier to find or cheaper to find issues sometimes um, has been my experience. Um, so those are some thoughts. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I do. I, I just wanted to say there is something about the materiality of it, because I do think there's something about I think the complete collections are great, but there is something sort of enshrining about them. Um, and it just all feels kind of like a fait accompli and something that's in the past. Whereas when you just see this kind of very modest little thing and that eventually is enshrined in that way, I think it also is it more encouraging in the sense of making people realize like, oh, I can make like a culturally vital object and it can be modest, but still engaging and powerful. Um, and I don't need to be, you know, capable of making a two volume hardcover box set, you know, to like have an impact on the world. Um, there's, a, there's another question in the chat I wanted to make sure to catch up to. And this, uh, this is from Austin who's asking me to read it. Uh, and Austin writes, thank you for an amazing talk. Margaret, I'm a great admirer of Melinda Gebby's cartooning, especially her underground comic, Fresca Zizis. I'm curious what impact Gebby's work had on Mars or Gregory or vice versa. I've heard Mars was an inspiration to Gebby entering comics. Do you know anything about that? I'm not a big Gebby scholar, um, but uh, they were all... Um participating through women's comics. I know that 
Um, and, you know, Fresca Zizus is also one of those comics that um, it's great, but it was also one of those comics that got censored and banned for its representations um, of sexuality. And so it's coming out at the same time. And the scene is, I don't want to say it's small, but it's small enough that people know each other at this time and are reading each other's work. Um, and so this is certainly something that uh, folks would have been reading and responding to. So for instance, also like I quoted um, Lee Mars's interview in Cultural Correspondence, which was an issue where they interviewed a whole bunch of women in underground comics. And one of the other people that they interviewed was Melinda Gebby. So this is, if you wanna um, look that up, I think it's Brown University has digitized for free all issues of Cultural Correspondence. I'm big on where things have been digitized. So you can ask me, I can point, I have a whole list of things that have been digitized online. Um, but so you could read um, her interview there um, at the time and her reflecting on that scene. And so she's, you know, seen as one, at, and this is like 79, right? So if you, yours after Fresca's easy and seen as like one of the women who's gonna, gonna be interviewed alongside people like Lee Mars and Roberta Gregory is interviewed in there and Trina Robbins and, um, you know, Diane Newman, Elaine kaminsky crumb So she's sort of seen as sort of in the mix, right? Um, so that's what I have. Yeah, that raises an interesting point too, actually, because, uh, you know, I've recently been doing some research on underground comics and I do, I, I don't know how you feel about this because it feels like there are a lot of people who were um, for many years very rarely interviewed, whereas in the past, maybe like 10 years, anyone who could be interviewed has been interviewed like 10 times, you know? So, so there's a kind of wealth of material uh, of people reflecting on experiences often once they're very well in the past. Um, but I do find that I've, I treasure things that are much closer to that moment. You know, those examples from something like cultural correspondence or like Cascade Comics Monthly or something like that, you know, where it's like in the seventies and people are still are talking about this stuff as it's happened rather than reflecting on it after it's been enshrined. Did you, did you find that to be the case also? Yeah, I, I well, I try to, um, you know, get a sense of things at the moment that they happen, like try to get a sense of like, you know, um, you know, Helene Sizu, like it's contemporaneous mm -hmm. to this, or, you know, mm -hmm. get those voices, go find those voices, um, like in cultural correspondence. Um, this is also helped by the fact that, you know, a bunch of grassroots sources are now digitized. So you can now find some of this um, material, or you can sometimes find it um, in um, physical archives as well, and try to get a sense of how these things were received at their moment, um, mm -hmm. which I think is also really important too, because, you know, some of these things have not um, been reprinted or super accessible in many years. So it's not like there's always a long tail conversation to follow. Although, you know, both Roberta Gregory and Lee Mars have continued to be artists who influence um, uh, like newer cartoonists through their continuing work, even if newer artists can't like access this earlier work. Um, so there's another question that I've been asked to read here from uh, Cookie Wollner. Uh, who writes, great talk, Margaret. I just learned about Lee Mars and Pudge earlier this year. How would you characterize the representation of fatness in here? Is the artist trying to expand ideas of, of women's beauty or is she just trying to be grotesque to push back on the usual representation of women in comics by men? As you probably know, there is a fat liberation movement in the Bay Area emerging at the time, although I would assume also uh, those were different scenes. So uh, about the representation of fatness in Pudge Girl Blimp and its relation to uh, fat liberation movement and that, you know, intersectionality. Yeah, I mean, I there is not a moment in the comic where she like goes to like a fat liberation event or something like that. Um, and there is, there are moments where the character does like goes on a diet and loses a whole bunch of weight and then then it reverses, but there is a sense that part of her journey through feminism is, is like bodily acceptance, right? Um, and is sort of aligned with um, what you might call sort of a, a fat a fat liberation um, sort of ethos that she needs to love herself as she is. And she receives the support um, for folks around her. Um, and there's not really a pushback um, on like how she's, um, on uh, like like no one around her in her community is saying you need to change right um and also her body 
is not necessarily played for laughs. They do like there are, you know, there is a moment where she eats all the cookies at the, she distracts all the women at the, um, at the, the, the group and she eats all the, to eat all the cookies. And so there are some jokes there about food humor that sort of get into that moment. But in terms of her bodily, bodily representation, there's no shaming or negativity there. So it is sort of a mixed bag, um, in terms of how you read it. And it's something that, um, I think is, um, you know, with our students, we, like, we grapple with that sort of, um, uh, you know, where is she being irreverent? What is she trying to say? Like, you know, there there is sort of a multiplicity in there and it's not trying to be a strictly ideological text in one way or the other. I hope that answers your question. Thanks for thanks for the question, it's a good one. Um, does anyone else have any uh, questions they'd like to pose today? You can uh, raise your hand virtually or indicate that some other way. Let's see, maybe, maybe go into the grid view just to make sure I'm not missing anyone jumping up and down and waving at me or anything. No. Um, doesn't look like it. So if there are no further questions, uh, please join me in, in thanking Margaret for being here tonight. I really appreciate uh, that very uh, rich talk, as well as the great questions that everyone brought afterwards. Thanks uh, <laughs> to, to Roberta Gregory for making unplanned cameo appearance tonight as well. Uh, as I, Next week, uh, we'll be back with Mac White as the guest, and I believe Austin will be moderating that session. So once again, uh, thank you to Margaret for joining us here tonight and sharing her work. And uh, if that uh, fascinated you as much as it fascinated me in almost any minute now you'll be able to pick up a copy of her new book invisible archives queer and feminist visual culture in the 1980s from the university of minnesota press uh thank you everyone and have a great night bye-bye thanks everyone great to see you all